Hello, welcome to our community presentation session. I have already welcomed our panelists in the prep session, and I'm delighted to see all of the attendees joining the session now. I will start us off with a couple of brief messages about the conference. Oops, there's our slate. Um, so here we have um, just the, your welcome from Force 11, the community organization hosting this conference. It is a free membership organization, and you're welcome to join and to visit the website at force11.org. Force 2021, this online conference is a community effort made possible through the work of all of the volunteers, as well as the contributions of the sponsors. And we really appreciate their support and recognize all of the sponsors listed here. A few things to be aware of about the conference is that all sessions are being recorded and will be made available after the conference concludes. You have the web link there for conference information on the SCED website, as well as the link to the code of conduct. And if you have any code of conduct related concerns, uh, please do raise those immediately as, as needed. I welcome you now to our community presentation session, which will include a series of lightning talks. Our first lightning talk, oh, look, actually I have a couple more um, just bits of information. All of the presenters are going to be encouraged to share their follow-up information in the chat and hopefully as also as part of their presentation. With a full slate of presenters in this one hour session, we may not have time for Q&A. I'd encourage you to share your questions in the chat or to just make a note to follow up with those presenters after the session. Now, let me welcome our first presenter, Maria. Hello everyone, I'm Maria Gould from California Digital Library and I lead the research organization registry initiative, better known as ROAR. Today, I'm talking about what we're doing at ROAR to develop sustainable open science infrastructure. I am going to share some challenges you've experienced and some of the lessons we've learned and are still learning along the way. So ROAR is a community-led registry of open, sustainable, usable, and unique identifiers for every research organization in the world. We launched this registry in 2019. ROAR identifiers are designed to be used widely across research infrastructure to help expose connections between research institutions and other components of the research cycle and research ecosystem. While there are other types of organization identifiers that exist, ROAR is unique because it is truly open, because it's specifically focused on identifying affiliations, and because it is being operated as a collaborative community-based initiative. ROAR is actually led by California Digital Library Crossref and DataCite in conjunction with a broader network of community advisors. So the scope of what we're trying to accomplish with ROAR is relatively small because we're focused on this specific, specific problem of affiliations and because we're keeping our overhead relatively low by setting up ROAR as a collaboration rather than as an independent organization all on its own. And ROAR has been able to get up and running fairly quickly because of this focused and collaborative approach we are taking, but we have still faced some challenges as we work to establish ROAR on stable footing for the long term. In short, growing up is hard to do. So today I'm sharing three of the biggest challenges we faced and then three lessons we've learned as we move forward. The first challenge is resourcing. Even a project as small as ROAR still has operational and personnel costs. Open infrastructure still costs money to build and maintain. And right-sizing the resourcing we need is also a challenge for ROAR. We really need to strike a balance between staying small and lean, but also having sufficient resourcing to keep delivering and growing. 
Getting resources for ROAR has also been a challenge in some cases because as a non-organization, ROAR itself um, is not eligible for certain types of funding. The second challenge is getting the right infrastructure or structure in place for operating ROAR. And there are a few key aspects to this. First, running it as a collaboration means we have to figure out how to balance contributions and roles across ROAR's operating organizations. And running it as a community initiative means we need to find ways to strategically engage community participation without relying too heavily on the community as volunteer labor. And we also need to design ways for ROAR to be sustainable that don't interfere with our overarching goal of keeping the registry data fully open. And the third challenge is about getting the story right about our path to sustainability. It can be challenging to communicate the aims and scope of ROAR because it doesn't fit neatly into pre-existing categories. It's also hard to make the case for why ROAR needs revenue to make something available for free. So what are we learning and how are we getting there? Lesson number one that we've learned is to stay balanced. We have a resourcing strategy for ROAR that diversifies our funding sources, so we're not dependent on a single source of revenue. We also have an agreement between our three organizations to define the specific contributions each organization makes and to make sure they're evenly distributed. Lesson two is to stay nimble. We're building out ROAR in an iterative way so we can adjust and improve as we go along based on what ROAR needs and what the community needs. This is how we approach our operations as well as our development work. And as we build out our sustainability plan, we're looking for creative ways to build pathways um, to sustainability into existing structures, like leveraging financial support through existing membership organizations like an add-on feed to Crossref and DataSite. Lesson number three is to stay open. This means designing ROAR around principles of openness by default. We rely on the guiding principles of POSI or principles of open scholarly infrastructure as a framework for sustainability and to follow best practices for managing ROAR in a responsible and sustainable way that allows our infrastructure and data to remain open and available over the long term. And staying open for ROAR also means keeping the broader community involved as we grow adoption of ROAR, um, collect feedback about future directions and work to maintain trust and accountability. So that's the very short story of how ROAR is working on growing up and reaching sustainability. And please get in touch if you'd like to learn more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next presenter will be Ahmed. And Ahmed, welcome to the, to the stage. Okay, welcome. Welcome everyone. I'm going to share my screen right away. Uh, okay, I will start right away. I hope the voice yeah. is uh, quite clear. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, okay, I'm going to present uh, our project. It's called WASH, stand for Safe water supply, sanitation, and hygiene. We know that wash aspect considered of uh, three major things regarding uh, uh, safe drinking water accessibility, sanitation infrastructure, and hygiene as well. The sustainable development goal number six, ensuring available and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. This was actually the base of the project. Uh, worldwide, the drinking water problem has been identified recently uh, by WHO and UNICEF as the following statistics. More than uh, 800 million people lack of basic drinking water services and more than 2 billion uh, lacking access to basic sanitation and 3 billion people have a poor hygiene practice. The burden of these aspects even further regarding the health it actually affects the health by waterborne diseases like diarrheal diseases with more than uh, 800,000 deaths per year. In Sudan, our country specifically, more than 12 million people have uh, lacking access of safe drinking water. And actually the aspects of wash not only affecting the health, furthermore, it affects uh, the economical status the environmental contamination, and furthermore, gender equity has been identified as a collateral issue. Uh, children's school deprivation, violence, and sexual harassment as well. Uh, this picture for one of the villages that we are working on, 
uh, the, this contaminated uh, service water, the only uh, source of their drinking water and domestic use. And they used to transport uh, this water by using uh, the effort of uh, women and children. Uh, so after that, they storage it in a barrels, a metal barrels, which also contaminated and they used to drink it uh, directly uh, as it is. As I mentioned before, the collateral damage of wash aspects uh, exceed the health burden to children's school deprivation because they, they used to bring water from very far distances and the poverty enforcement as well. So the project, our project WASH was built to tackle this issue and has been endorsed under IFMSA International Federation of Migration. We are not only doctors, but also we are researchers and health uh, providers. So WASH project consists of three phases. The first phase, it's an assessment phase. We assess the quality of drinking water uh, and waterborne uh, diseases by using a standardized questionnaire and uh, field uh, H2S quality kits. Furthermore, we have a collaboration with the National Laboratory in Sudan uh, to um, analyze this water by a physiochemical analysis and microbial analysis. After these extensive work in assessment, we have the second phase of the project with a short-term intervention. Uh, in this phase, particularly, we are tackling the issue uh, of increasing the awareness regarding uh, safe drinking water and uh, hygiene, uh, positive practice, furthermore, to provide them with basic knowledge regarding the sanitation measures. And the final phase of the project, it's an evidence-based and sustainable intervention. We can't do it because of lack of sources, of course, but we are building collaborations and partnership, and we are interested to make an active work with NGOs in Washfield uh, to build an evidence-based sustainable interventions. The project was started uh, three years ago. Uh, the previous three years, uh, was done in 14 localities in Sinari State in Sudan and covered the benefit of more than 70,000 individuals with collateral gains regarding children's school adherence and women empowerment was also approved. And this is a story of success. One of the villages in the left side, uh, this is there, it was uh, the source of drinking water and domestic use and the right side of, after we made the long-term intervention in phase three, uh, we built uh, a whole station and they can have an access of drinking safe water. Uh, furthermore, furthermore, WASH regarding uh, this phase um, uh, in 2021 and 2022, now we are targeting more than 27 localities and covering more than 10,000 population per locality. So we achieved for both first and second phase of the project, while the third phase is, is under uh, process. So this is the pictures regarding the first phase of the project, the assessment phase of this uh, state. It's called Kadugli State in South uh, Kordofan in Sudan. And this is the second phase, our uh, uh, team members and uh, volunteers doing the health education program for the local population. Regarding the assessment phase, this is a quick, uh, this is a quick tackling regarding the quality of data we are collecting the assessment phase. Here I have Thank just an example. Thank you for sharing yeah. your success. We are delighted to hear it. Um, unfortunately, we are at time. I'd encourage okay. you to share follow-up information um, in the chat. So those with um, questions, Great. Um, are able to reach you. Yeah. Thank you for will, your I, important and um, important presentation, and it, we're delighted to learn of it. Our next okay, presentation will be from Dominique. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me well. I'm just going to share my screen now. Good. Is this working? 
Okay, um, great. Okay, so yeah, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Don Roche. I'm a postdoc at Carleton University in Canada, and I'll be presenting a research project. It's been led by Ilias Burberry, who's a graduate student working with me. Oops, I didn't get these slides to change. Good. Okay, so open and fair data are increasingly popular with uh, both funders and publishers because they can help us to understand and validate research results identify and correct errors, and they're also broadly uh, acknowledged to accelerate scientific discoveries. And so because of that, more and more journals uh, are adopting open data policies, especially in my field, which is ecology and evolutionary biology. So this is a good thing, obviously, uh, but one key challenge here is to understand these policies uh, because they're, they're not always straightforward and also to keep up with changes in these policies across lots of different journals. So we're lucky to have tools like uh, the Sherpa Romeo database that help us keep track of journals open access policies, but right now there's no equivalent um, for policies on open data. So Another challenge, uh, this one more from a, a meta science perspective, is determining what are the benefits of requiring authors to share their data. This is important because um, we often assume that open data are good for science and that they're good for society, but we don't actually have that much empirical evidence to show for it. So the two objectives of the study um, were to first generate a living database with information on the data policies of journals in ecology and evolution, and then secondly, to examine how these data policies have affected error correction rates. So for our first objective, um, we comb through the data policies of the 199 journals that are listed under ecology and evolutionary biology uh, in Web of Science. And then we categorize them into four different tiers based on two criteria. So we looked at whether uh, the journal requires a data availability statement and whether the journal requires open data as a condition of publication. And we put all of this information, including details like the date um, of each policy's implementation into a database that's publicly available on the Open Science Framework. And overall, we found that 20% of journals in ecology and evolution do not have a data policy whatsoever. 30% of journals encourage authors to share their data, but they have no requirements. 15% of the journals require a data availability statement, but that statement could be something like data are available on request. And then 20%, so one out of five journals, um, has a mandatory open data policy. In our second objective, we use these data to ask the question, when journals require open data, does this lead to more errors being corrected in scientific papers? And to answer this question, we collected information on retractions from a database that's maintained by Retraction Watch. So this is a comprehensive list of retractions uh, across the scientific literature that uh, goes back to 2001. And we then compared the total number of retractions per year for journals in ecology and evolution before and after their data policy was implemented. And for journals without a policy, we use the mean implementation date of journals that do have a policy. And so here are the results. Um, this graph here shows uh, the number of retractions per year on the y-axis before and after the data policy was implemented. And in the table on the right, um, you have the mean difference in retractions before and after the policy with the corresponding statistics from a permutation test. So first, if we look at the difference for journals without a data policy, um, we see no changes in the number of retractions per year. And essentially, this can be considered as our control group, right? So when we look at journals that only recommend open data, we also find no effect of this policy type on error correction rates. We find the same pattern for journals that require a data availability statement, but not open data. And then finally, um, when we look at journals that have a mandatory open data policy, uh, the pattern is really different. So the number of retractions per year is almost five times greater in the period after journals start requiring authors to share their data. 
So what this suggests uh, is that mandatory open data policies appear to increase rates of error correction, at least in the field of ecology and evolution. And just briefly uh, to summarize things, our first objective here was to create a living database of open data policies. And um, we showed that more than two thirds of journals in ecology and evolution have an open data policy. And then secondly, um, we wanted to look at some potential benefits of these open data policies and found that um, mandatory, these mandatory open data policies are linked to greater rates of error correction. Thanks very much. Thank you. Our next presentation will welcome Cooper. Uh, hi everyone, hopefully you can hear me. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, so today in this lightning talk, I've got another one in a minute. Um, I'll be presenting a project, it's very new, called MERITS, and it stands for Meta Research Evaluation Repository for Identifying Trustworthy Science. So this was a project that we kicked off at the eLife Innovation Sprint a couple of months ago, uh, which was a two-day event. And so what I'll be presenting is just the prototype that we built and the sort of vision for the project. So this project is based on the idea that there's lots of interest in developing alternative metrics uh, with DORA and post-publication peer review, but currently there's not a large lot of adoption for these platforms. Uh, and even in recent years, there's been a number of platforms that have started implementing new types of me uh, metrics that we might evaluate research on, um, but currently there's not a lot of research into them. And all of these metrics tend to remain isolated on each different platform. So what we were trying to do is build a product that would consolidate these ratings into a central location so that we can do a few, few things like in, improve the visibility of these ratings uh, and support meta research into creating better metrics and also foster innovation in scholarly communication and evaluation. So uh, the sprint was over two days organized by eLife. Um, our aim was to build a prototype of this concept and so basically what we were looking to do is pull in some ratings from a number, a number of different sources um, and display them in some kind of an easy user interface for people to identify ratings where they exist. So what we got done is I think quite a lot uh, over, over two days. So we've managed to import some code um, from a couple of APIs from pre-review and plotted. Um, and we built a prototype database. So this was using Airtable and uh, interface called Stacker HQ. Uh, and we wrote a lot of documentation. So we wrote the README, um, we created a license, and we identified some user stories um, spanning people like uh, researchers, administrators, and journalists who might want to use this tool once it's more developed. So this was our team. Um, it was an international team, so it was really fun coordinating across three different time zones. Um, but particular thanks to Dawn Holford, who co-led this project with me. Um, and I'm probably under time for the first time ever. Oh no, I've got one more slide. Um, <laughs> so uh, where it's at right now is a proof of concept and a prototype with a, a bit of data in there. Um, right now, the, the first use case we're imagining is to do meta research, because we have some ideas about how we want to study metrics and try and improve the way that we design uh, and implement metrics moving forward. Um, but we're also interested in developing the in user interface and turning this into a prototype website um, and expanding to other platforms that we don't currently have data for like Society and, and Prelights and DocMaps. Um, and another uh, use case that we're interested in is letting anyone in the world enter their own ratings that they might've collected through studies or through journal processes and so forth. And eventually we think we'll uh, create an API so that people can pull data out of this database and use it uh, for their own means. And that's it, thank you very much. Please get in touch if you have more questions. Thank you, enjoyed your presentation. Our next presentation will be John. Welcome, John. Hi everyone, uh, my name is John Borgie. I am the manager of research and instruction at uh, Lane Medical Library here at Stanford. And I'm here to describe a project that we're doing to um, assess the openness of COVID-19 related randomized control trials. And so 
<clears throat> there's really two motivations for, for this work. Uh, the first is pretty proximal. Uh, my, my team and I support biomedical researchers in adopting and using open science practices. So I'm always looking for uh, a re another reason to leverage and show off that expertise, but also a, a reason to get some firsthand experience using open science methods ourselves. And I think the broader sort of motivation for this is in evidence-based medicine, which my team also does some instruction and consultation on, um, RCTs are frequently referred to as the gold standard of evidence. And, and we could have a very long conversation about what that means and, and <laughs> all that, but I think we could all probably appreciate the importance of um, something within with that carries that label being transparent and, and open in the setting we are all finding ourselves in right now. Um, so openness, um, broadly conceived in the context of this project, we're looking at openness for research reports, availability of data and other materials and, and things like study registration as well. So I'm going to talk a bit about our methods and some of our very preliminary results side by side. And I will emphasize that these are extremely preliminary <laughs> results. Um, so my team also uh, does quite a few consultations related to literature searching. Um, our methods, I'm going to be very careful in saying are not those of a systematic review, but we are trying our best to find all of the um, COVID-19 related um, RCT papers that we can find that relate to um, pharmaceutical interventions for prevention or treatment. So vaccines and post-infection um, treatment. And we're using um, covidence for deduplication and, and screening. And there's a whole process and it's taking quite a long time actually to work through our, our, our papers because um, we have more than a year and a half worth of RCTs to look at. Um, okay, and so to identify how open these publications are, um, we're using unpaywall data. And you can see here on the right side of the screen that actually the, the vast majority of this sample of 100 randomly selected papers that have been screened so far are actually openly available. This is relatively unsurprising to me, uh, just given the efforts from journal publishers and NIH and all kinds of entities across the world to increase access to these kind of papers. Um, and we've also been able to track down uh, preprints, which preceded the publication of about a quarter of these papers. And to do that, we're looking at Europe PMC, who do a tremendous job indexing preprints from a variety of preprint servers for title and author matches. And so frequently we'll find like a preprint with a slightly different title, but the same group of authors describing the same things. Um, but most of those are on Meta Archive, but yeah, about a quarter of our papers so far we've been able to, to find preprints for. The story for data sharing is less optimistic, <laughs> I'll say. Um, we are using uh, a piece of information, which is that the ICM JE, a group of uh, medical journal editors are requiring for their journals and recommending for others to have data availability statements um, for papers describing RCTs. What we have found is slightly over half, and by that I mean exactly 51 out of 100 papers actually carry these statements in them. And when we examine the contents of those statements, we find that the vast majority of folks are saying that the data is available upon request. Um, which was mentioned in a previous talk is not an ideal situation. I will say that um, not all of this is by request to the authors. Some of it is by request to the sponsors or IRBs or other entities, but the vast majority is by request. Um, and then we have two out of our 100, which say that the data has been deposited in a repository. Only one of those two actually give a persistent identifier or a location on the repository where the data can be found rather than just the name. And we also have one um, publication that says that data is available, but then when you look to try to identify how it is actually available, like your guess is as good as mine about how to actually get that data. So it says yes, but then the method makes no sense to me. Um, so we are also going to be examining, you know, whether or not the papers have been registered, um, ICMJE and, and requires and recommends that any um, RCT that's published must have been registered in a public registry. Uh, we're checking up on that. I don't have that data yet. 
And we also are looking um, just at paper characteristics. I'm, I'm very curious to see if there's any relationship between kind of where these journals are. Um, I'm sure there is a relationship between where they're being published and kind of the, the openness along the dimensions we're interested in. But I'm also interested to see like if highly cited or significantly talked about papers through like alt metrics or something, um, if there's any kind of relationships there. Um, and of course, if folks have suggestions about that, I'll put up my contact information at the end, and I'm happy to talk about all of that. So our next steps in terms of we want to demonstrate best practice while we are looking at practices ourselves. So we are going to be making all of our data and code um, available. Our protocol, which is quite extensive now, talking about the exact methods we're using to get all this information will be made available. And we will, at the very least, be posting a preprint um, sometime early to mid-2022, describing all of our results. So thanks, everyone. I, my contact information is here. And, and please feel free to contact me with questions, comments, and any suggestions you might have. Thank you. And for our next presentation, we welcome Joy. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Joy Owango. I'm the Executive Director of the Training Center in Communication based at the University of Nairobi in Kenya. And we support researchers on how they can improve their research output and increase their visibility through scholarly and science communication. And I am one of, uh, TCC Africa is one of the project partners on the Open Reviews, Pro, uh, Reviews Program in which we are doing it in collaboration with IDA Africa, Africa Archive Pre-Review and LIFE. Now, um, what we're trying to do is create a workshop that will empower next generation of African peer reviewers. And this came about uh, in the first webinar that we ever held, that was in 2020 on the rapid and open peer review. And we were looking at the technologies that existed in the global north and we had amazing speakers, including pre-review then. And, um, and we realized some of the challenges that African researchers faced was um, bias when it came to peer review and even understanding some of the latest technologies in peer review. And as a result of that, um, we partnered with the peer review, IDA Africa and uh, Africa Archive, and we started hosting a series of African work, uh, a series of workshops on best practices and innovative approaches to peer review. So that's, and this came about, as I'd mentioned earlier from the, the participant, because they noticed that there's always an unfair approach to peer review, especially when it comes to African researchers. So we did this between, um, uh, between April and May, we did uh, a series of, uh, of, of these workshops. And out of that, what came out very clearly was that there was a need to foster transformative and equal, and equal knowledge production, improve opportunities for, Africans, uh, for African scholars, and uh, provide access to African scholars on, uh, to, to scalable training in peer review, and raising awareness about preprints and how to use and enrich the scholarly publishing process and knowledge and access the knowledge uh, uh, access the knowledge that comes out of it. So the goals of this project include building capacity and enthusiasm for scholarly open review for preprints among African researchers, offer opportunities to actively participate in peer review to help decolonize the academic publishing process by creating equitable opportunities for African researchers. As I had said, this was the main issue that came out of the very first uh, workshop that we hosted in 2020 on peer review. Now, the result of this led to um, a grant from the Wellcome Trust, which, is, which falls under the Wellcome Trust uh, Research Enrichment Grant Diversity and Inclusion Program. And out of this, we are the same partners that is Africa Archive, Ida Africa, Pre-Review, and the eLife and TCC Africa have come up with a program that will focus on training the next peer reviewers coming out of the continent. And together we will, we will foster an open and inclusive approach to peer review, highlight 
manuscripts authored uh, by African scholars or covering African relevant content. And the, the reason why we are focusing on this is because there's already a preconceived bias on the research that is already coming out of the continent. So sometimes the peer review is not particularly uh, representative of what is coming out of the continent or the, because of the bias can be quite negative. So that is why we really need to highlight the manuscripts coming out of African scholars. Create a safe space for reflection around issues of um, scholarly knowledge, especially when it comes to decolonization. And we've seen quite a bit of pushback amongst researchers from the global north on the decolonization of research coming out of the continent as well. Biases in academic environment, as I'd said, because of these preconceived biases. So it had been quite challenging for, for genuine peer review to come out or to be representative uh, coming out of the continent. Open scholarship tools and practices and additional topics that may emerge during the dynamic group discussions that we'll be hosting. So what we intend to do is um, with this peer of African peer review project is train the trainer model. So we are going to recruit and engage uh, about 10 African researchers and train them on how to be peer reviewers who will in turn train uh, fellow researchers. We need to focus on multilingualism, which has been convenient, con conveniently ignored coming out of the continent because of the bias on English being the language of science. And as such, coming out of a continent that has already 2000 languages, we want to focus on the African Union languages, that is French, Arabic and also English as well, and with room to open up further to more uh, languages. Openness, we want to make sure that all the resources are open and also adaptable. And this is something that can be replicated anywhere in the global south as well. So we are looking at the ongoing support which you're going to offer through eLife, uh, the, the through eLife's ECR reviewers uh, pool and also offered some uh, offer to build support on public profiles as preprint reviewers uh, with platforms such as pre-review and citing. The materials that we intend to produce will include workshop curricula, which would be accessible and used to help participants work through the process of writing a preprint review, assess and mitigate biases so that they can understand what actually exists when it comes to the biases that are considered when it comes to, to reviewing. Um, the trainer's guide will also assist trainers in the delivery of the workshop in facilitating tips to engage participants on peer-to-peer -peer experience, sharing and self-reflection, templates for registrations and emails to participants, which will be needed for pre-workshop feedback and guidelines to lead in an inclusion and respectful workshop. The Thank timeline you, of Joy. The I um, enjoyed hearing about this project. And if you want to just make sure we see the contact and follow-up info, um, really appreciate learning about this project. Okay. All right. So we are, I'm winding up. So we are in three phases. So we are going to have this in three phases. The first one is the content creation, which is going on, training of recruitment of trainers, which will be next year, and the, the, and the workshop and the delivery of the evaluation. So that is the workshop, and this is a summary of what the workshop is all going, it's going to be about. And you can reach us in any of these contacts that have been in the last slide. Thank you so much. And thank you. Now we welcome back Cooper. Hello again, everyone. Um, this presentation will, will be a, a project that's much more established. So it's been going for uh, two or three years now. Um, and it's called Project Free Our Knowledge. And its long-term vision is to create a sustained movement for cultural change. The main uh, motivation for this project is the idea that we're trapped in a collective action problem. Basically, we all know that there are better ways that we can do things, but at the individual level, we have strong incentives to maintain the status quo rather than move towards an open science future. And so to use this uh, pyramid that Brian Nosek has created, well, what, where we're at is basically we've created infrastructure and easy user interfaces, but we're stuck at this community phase. So we know that there's high rates of support for open science, much higher rates than actual adoption. Uh, and uh, the psychologists out there will recognize that this is similar to a prisoner's dilemma paradox, but the difference is that we can actually communicate about how we want to take action. And in recent years and decades, there's been a growing number of online conditional pledge platforms like Kickstarter that have enabled communities around the world to overcome comparable collective action problems 
by taking conditional pledges. So all free our knowledge is trying to do is bring the same strategy to academia, which hasn't uh, properly been implemented yet uh, within the research community. So the way the platform works is to anyone can propose a campaign that includes both an action that they want their peers to adopt, along with a threshold for uh, people to take that action. Um, and now this can be posting a preprint, sharing some data, um, posting a, a review and so forth. And once we've developed that campaign, we put it up on the website. And at this point, anyone around the world can pledge to take action if and when that threshold, of, uh, threshold is met. And crucially, because pledges can be anonymous, there's no risk to the individual at this point until they have community support. And finally, if we do reach that threshold, everyone is listed on the website and uh, directed to carry out the action together. So right now we've uh, got a, a GitHub that basically anyone can use to propose and develop campaigns. And this is created uh, just by posting a new issue, issue on the GitHub repository. Um, we've got a couple of campaigns on development right now that I'm very excited about. So the first is called Publish Your Reviews, and this is being developed in conjunction with ASAP Bio. And the idea is that anytime you perform a review for a journal uh, on a paper that is already a preprint, then you just attach your review to that preprint using any number of platforms that already exist. And the second campaign I want to bring to your attention is an open code pledge. And this evolved out of the brain hack uh, at OHBM this year. And the idea here is that some critical mass of people would begin to share their code together for every article that they publish. Uh, and so these are currently under development on our GitHub repository, but we've also got a number of uh, campaigns that you can see on our website, which is freeourknowledge.org. Um, and some of our past campaigns include pre-registration pledge and a variety of open access pledges. So just finally, this is the long-term vision for the project. The idea is that we're trying to make um, open science practices normative in the long term. And the way that we think we can do this is by sort of kickstarting or propelling forward the movement through um, adoption uh, through these conditional pledges. So right now with open code, for example, uh, there's uh, not, not that many people are sharing their code, but there's a larger proportion of people in the community who would share if they knew that there was community support for doing so. And so our idea is that we can create this ambassador network, which reaches out to the community, collects these pledges. And then once we get that critical mass of support for that campaign, everybody starts sharing together. And so now we have a larger community that we can draw on to uh, increase our ambassador network. And at some point in the future, by building on these campaigns over time across different fields like code, data, um, publishing, we can create this uh, network that one day will be large enough to uh, kickstart uh, a normative change in a particular field. And so through this process, we're developing replicable processes and also developing strategies like the ambassador network and workshops that we wanna run. And the, the key idea is that all of these processes are replicable so that we can transfer them from one campaign to another, but we're also interested in analyzing through meta research, what strategies are actually working and so that we can improve on them as we move forward and create a sustained movement for cultural change. And so here are some ways that you can get involved uh, if you're interested uh, or would like to propose or develop a campaign, please get in touch. Thanks very much. Thank you, Cooper. The next project will pre be presented by Sam. Thank you, one sec. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sam Toplitsky. I'm the Open Science Librarian at UC Berkeley. And today I'm speaking on behalf of Ariel Deerdorf and John Borgie, who you just heard from. Um, and I'm happy to be talking about the Bay Area Open Science Group, which is a reboot of a group that originated with Stanford's Lane Library and expanded to include UCSF. And now we've relaunched it in its current form with our three campuses, um, the University of California, San Francisco, um, me at Berkeley and Stanford. So we rotate hosting duties among the campuses and we bring together researchers, faculty, postdocs, graduate students, staff and librarians too from all of our communities. And our aim is to learn about open science together, 
to discuss the application of open science practices in a research context, and just generally to meet other members of the community who are interested in or who are already incorporating open science practices into their work. You can see on the slide the events we've held so far and some we have planned for the new year as well as a link to our site. Um, as we grow this community, we're relying on the community participation model developed by the Center for Scientific Collaboration and Community Engagement. You all may have seen this in other venues and that's depicted here. I took the um, CSCCE's community engagement course this past year and another member of our group um, is enrolled for a future session. We found this to be a really useful framework as we build our group. And you know, there's no one size fits all approach to this sort of outreach and community building. But I, for one, have really appreciated the goal of moving away from this one to many or what CSCCE labels a convey consume model. And I think for me, this is often what I fall into in library work when I offer a workshop and the audience isn't clearly defined or I wonder why people aren't being more interactive in the session. So we're hoping to move from that model to one that's more collaborative and helps us develop as a community. We still have a bit of work to go, but um, having this framework is helping us guide our outreach and foster um, a group that we hope is welcoming and inviting and um, inspiring. So um, we're only about a semester in to our rebooted group, but there are a few things that are going well, well, more than a few things. Um, we've had three well-attended virtual Zoom meetings this fall. Um, We've invited a variety of speakers from our different campuses to present on different aspects of open science and how it weaves into their work. We had um, some lively discussions about open science to kick things off, just kind of an intro to get everyone on the same page. Then we invited um, Tiffany Tang, a graduate student at Berkeley, to talk about um, open science principles and specifically contributor roles and how they played a part in a COVID data repository that her lab created. And most recently, we discussed open peer review with Mario Maliki from Stanford. We've noticed that many of our attendees have returned for multiple sessions. And um, generally, we have a speaker introduce their work and follow on with um, kind of more informal discussion. And people have been um, engaged and participating. And I'll also add for myself, um, as one of the three co-hosts, it's been great to share the work um, with John and Ariel. So we still have more to do um, for the future. Building a new community is slow. Um, there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one recruitment that can be challenging to um, reach out to people. But at the same time, we, we, we found that the people who are showing up are really engaged and connected to the topic. Um, so um, ultimately, we'd like to move from this one-to-many um, model where we're kind of presenting um, and having people react to that to something that's more collaborative and community led. And that's something that we're still working on. So um, we have launched this group with a local focus, but we definitely welcome comments and um, collaborators near and far. And we would be glad to talk more about this um, offline. Thanks so much. Thank you. Now let's welcome Jefferson. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Let me share my screen. And of course, thanks to Force 11 and to all of you who are attending. All right, so I'm Jefferson Bailey. I'm director of Web Archiving Data Services Internet Archive, and I'm talking about uh, our project, Internet Archive Scholar. Uh, so what is this project? Uh, basically, a number of years ago, we decided uh, Internet Archives, for those who don't know, is a nonprofit online uh, digital library and archive based in the US. Uh, been around for about 25 years. We decided a number of years ago we really needed to improve our uh, preservation efforts around scholarly material. Uh, we're best known for the Wayback Machine and web archiving, and there's plenty of scholarly stuff in there. Uh, but we really wanted to help open, uh, open access and open knowledge uh, by providing preservation infrastructure. So leveraging IA's open nonprofit infrastructure, we own and operate all our own data centers. We don't use any commercial cloud services. Uh, and do that for the preservation access of especially long tail open access scholarly material. And that could help address sort of the curation and uh, repository preservation problems um, in the open scholarly world. Uh, 
given the scale of material that you can now do on the web. So let me get the slides going. How are we doing this? A couple of different methods. We scrape a whole lot of persistent identifier metadata to use as signals for what to archive. Uh, we we add mine aggregation lists like on paywall and core and other repositories uh, that are providing access, but maybe not interested in long-term preservation. Uh, partnerships with places like ISSN, OA, we hit OAI PMH feeds, basically just as much metadata as we can collect that can tell us where open access scholarly material lives on the web that we can then go and archive. So that's the top-down method. Bottom up is the Wayback Machine is huge. It's, uh, I don't know, tens of petabytes. There's a lot of scholarly material already in there. So can we use machine learning and artificial intelligence methods to identify it and extract it? And then lastly, lots of partnerships and things like that. We of course also archive all this metadata. So if you're interested in dumps from PID services or like a snapshot of Microsoft Academic Graph was shut down, uh, we have a lot of that too, because that's uh, on, the, on the back end of the catalog. That of course feeds these global harvesting efforts in the web archiving uh, approaches. We process it all, churn it, and then basically put it in a big bibliographic catalog that lays on top of sort of the Wayback Machine collection. Uh, for the bottom up stuff, we have some machine learning tools that we could share around determining whether an article is a research or a scholarly article, metadata extraction, fuzzy matching techniques, uh, PID assignments, if it doesn't have one, things like that. What do we have? We have about 177 million research outputs totaling about 250 terabytes after about two to three years of dedicated effort that boils down to about 125 million papers. Some of that is obviously a version of record journal articles. Some of it might be preprints. Some of it might be author version. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of different versions that might come with any individual work, uh, but it's a lot of stuff. Around 32 million of those we have put into the uh, Internet Archive Scholar, which I'll talk about in a second. And those uh, have full text search. They are uh, have a lot of metadata. They're highly identified and they are the primary version. Around 14 million of those, so a little less than half of that corpus, we think have no other known pres uh, preservation happening at all. So I think that's good. Uh, that accounts, so in there are about 180,000 uh, journals. We're archiving about 40,000 artifacts each day, and there's some tech stats. Uh, I encourage everyone to visit scholar.archive.org. We launched it earlier this year. Uh, it is um, a, a search and discovery interface to open access scholarly material that we have archived. Um, so check it out and give us uh, feedback. This is, of course, uh, there's much more content that we have than it is that in, is in this interface. Uh, but we're, we're updating the, the volume each day. Uh, there's, of course, partnerships, as I also mentioned, and I wanted to just give a shout out to a couple of those as I wrap up. Uh, Project Jasper is something we're doing with Directory of, Ac of Open Access Journals, the Clocks Archive Public Knowledge uh, Project, which runs OJS, the Open Journal System, and ISSN, so that uh, nonprofit OA journals can auto-deposit their material instead of us crawling it on the web, which sometimes has imperfections, they can actually upload it for preservation into IA and clocks and other preservation repositories. We also have integration with Center for Open Science and we're starting to explore how we can ensure that all uh, scholarly material that is open in OSF can be backed up in the internet archive for long-term preservation. Uh, we're being indexed with Google Scholar and yes, we asked Google Scholar if it was okay to name our project IA Scholar, if that's a question. <laughs> Uh, and also working with Semantic Scholar, Keepers, Registry, and a number of interlibrary loan services. Uh, we released a big citation corpus, and we have lots of different products and services, many of them free since we're a nonprofit, and some of them at cost uh, for journals, institutions, uh, and researchers. That's it. Thank you. And shout out to Mellon and IMLS, which, is, which have helped fund some of this work, and the engineers and uh, consultants listed there. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome now to Bianca with our final talk. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. I'm going to share my screen. And oh, I thought I had this. I'm very sorry. Uh, 
actually just a second. There we go. There we go. Jennifer, could you verbally confirm that you can actually see my screen now? That's perfect. Yes, I can see it. Lovely. So thanks very much. And really happy to finish off this, um, this final round of community presentation. Also very happy to follow directly from Jefferson because I think these two talks really nicely complement each other. I'll be talking about uh, comparing sources of open metadata, also on behalf of Cameron Nalen from the Curtin Institute in Australia, who is hopefully sound asleep at this time of the night for him. This also, uh, this talk also ties into a community discussion we had earlier today about open metadata, which really started with the statement that without open metadata, there's no open science. It's really part and parcel of open science. And when we look at uh, open metadata efforts that are currently ongoing, and Jefferson gave a very nice example of that just before my presentation, we can see three approaches to making richer open metadata available. And the first is advocacy and persuasion, mostly of publishers to make their metadata openly available. The second one is harvesting either of existing metadata or of full text, and then extracting those metadata. And the third one is community curation. And there are a number of examples of all of these different approaches. Uh, for instance, the Initiative for Open Citations and the Initiative for Open Abstracts, trying to uh, advocate for publishers to deposit their metadata those additional metadata to Crossref, uh, OpenAlex, uh, OpenAir and Core for the harvesting approach, Wikidata for the community approach and also the community um, curation that Crossref is currently planning. And just some examples, as you saw in the talk just before me, there are many other very valuable attempts, very valuable initiatives. And to get to a rich landscape of metadata, I think it's really important to not just see who has the most or who, has, who is the biggest or make this into a contest, but really see how all these initiatives can complement each other. And also to look at what's currently missing and how these initiatives can work to improve that. So looking at what's currently missing from all that metadata. And that's what some of the work we did, uh, Cameron and I did together with the infrastructure from Koki that's using all open sources of metadata to provide information to universities, but also to, it allows us also to compare different sources of metadata. And one of the things we did was uh, compare Microsoft Academic that is retiring by the end of the year with OpenAlex, which uh, funded by Arcadia, an open, fully open, first replacement of Microsoft Academic. And then also with enrichment, it will really be their own product. They released their first data sets uh, a couple of weeks ago and we were able to compare both of them and able to, com to confirm that indeed at the moment, it's a very truthful replication of Microsoft Academic. And the only thing that's missing are the patents. And that's why the total number is a little bit lower, but otherwise it's really comparable, which is, which is nice to see. And also nice to know that our uh, workflow is working. What you can see here is that uh, part of the coverage of OpenAlex is uh, overlapping with COSF, and they also have quite a bit that's unique, that's not in COSF. Looking a little, more, little bit more at that overlap between OpenAlex and COSF, you can investigate the added value of, in this case, OpenAlex, the added value for affiliations for different publication types, the added value for abstracts for different publication types, and a big shout out to the preprint archive for the excellent archiving of abstracts uh, in, in COSF. And also see that uh, OpenAlex has a lot more subject information than uh, COSF at the moment. So just some things where you can see where current, uh, current coverage of metadata and also where currently gaps still are. Because for instance, you can say, look at coverage of affiliation, but you can also drill down to, for instance, different types of journals, uh, different languages, different countries, and see where coverage is better than in others. We had a little, we had a community discussion this morning where we also collectively uh, looked at which types of metadata are important and uh, also are more or less open. 
And from that, uh, we zoomed in on importance, for instance, on retractions and withdrawals as a currently often missing part of metadata. And also, um, there was quite some interest to work together to develop a subject classification open metadata for that. So in general, I think the, uh, the plea is for the multiple approaches. They're not mutually exclusive. They can complement each other, meeting in the middle for which metadata future. And contact details are here, and I also put them in the chat. And thank you very much for your attention and for Force 11 for the opportunity to present this. Thank you, everyone, for being such wonderful presenters and audience. Uh, next up, we have the final event of the conference, and I will conclude this session. Everyone, hope to see you there. <laughs>